So I, I see a, f a, a few faces that have been here uh, previously, but I'm assuming that for many of you, this is your first time to Adam Smith's house. Perhaps you've just come because it was one of these free events during the Fringe, and it's you know, cheaper than paying 20 quid to go see a dance performance or a play. Um, or perhaps you're here because you know of Adam Smith, you appreciate his work, or you know our speaker for this evening, and you're excited to hear what she has to say. Um, so Penmere House is not a museum. Yes, it uh, was the last home of Adam Smith. Um, but for us, Penmere House is an invitation because it was Adam Smith's home. And not simply just Adam Smith's home, we see it as a symbol of the Scottish Enlightenment and the Enlightenment generally. But again, we're not here to do historiography, though we do do some historiography and study the lives of Smith and many of his contemporaries, as you will hear this evening. What Penmere House is, is a 21st century home of social and economic debate. Because it was indeed in this room, many, many, many years ago, when Smith was alive, that he would hold salons with other contemporaries of his time to debate many of the social and economic and moral issues that they were dealing with at such an interesting time in human history. And so for us, we, we think of Panmere House as an invitation to discuss the challenges that we face today, from what makes a good society, what kind of economic policy, policy should we have, what do we owe each other as human beings. As such, Panmere House programs are designed to engage us with the big issues that we face today. And importantly, we'd like to foster and promote nuanced and respectful debate at a time when it is much needed. Tonight, we have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Sandrine Berges, who is a professor of philosophy at Bilkent University in Ankara in Turkey. Sandrine studied philosophy at King's College London and Birkbeck before moving to the University of Leeds, where she obtained her PhD in 2000. Sandrine works on the history of moral and political philosophy, from ancient philosophy of Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, to medieval philosophy, Eloise, Christine de Pizan, to early modern, such as Cavendish, and importantly, 18th century. And in particular, focusing on the works of too often forgotten women philosophers such as Wollstonecraft, Sophie de Grouchy, Marie-Jeanne Roland, and Olympe de Gouges. She also works on contemporary social and political philosophy with an emphasis on the capability approach and feminism. The capability approach, which I should add, is, is also influenced by Adam Smith through Amartya Sen. She's a member of, a pro of Project Vox and the New Narratives Proje Project which is an international group striving to reintroduce important texts by women philosophers into teaching and research. Indeed, at a moment when the Enlightenment is looked at as something bad, we actually can remember that it was much more diverse than you might think. In September 2022, she received an Emma Goldman Snowballed, Snowball Award from the Flax Foundation. The award recognizes talented and innovative scholars working on feminist and inequality issues. It is my pleasure to welcome Sandrine Berges. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. So, hi, everybody. Uh, first, I would really like to thank Blair Barrows and uh, Dr. Hewitt and Dr. Professor Dixon, as well as everyone who works here at Penmure House. It's wonderful to be here. Um, it's very exciting. And I had the privilege to see the play about Adam Smith and Hume yesterday, which was absolutely amazing as well. So thank you for having me. So today I'd like to talk to you about, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Smith's impact on the French Revolution and in particular the impact he had via the translation and commentary of his theory of moral sentiment by a French philosopher, Sophie de Grouchy, who's also uh, called the Marquise de Condorcet, because she was married to Nicolas Condorcet. So 
I'm going to start by giving a brief account of Smith's time in Paris in 1764. Then I want to talk about the various the history of how his work was translated into French, because I was quite interested, and because that's that's one of the reasons why Sophie Grouchy was the one to have the most impact using Smith on the revolution, because she produced the best translation. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit as well about her revolutionary life. And then finally, I'll talk about um, her commentary. I'll give you some philosophical analysis of her commentary on Smith's work. So let's start in January 1764, then, when uh, a Scottish professor came to Paris. So he was already well known for his theory of moral sentiments. He hadn't written yet uh, Wealth of Nations. He stayed in Paris for 10 months as part of a two-year visit to Europe. And while he was in Paris, he met with a lot of people, but in particular, he met with Anne-Robert Turgot, who is the gentleman over there with the pretty curls. Um, and Albert Hugo was just, when, when Smith arrived, he was just about to become the Controller General of Finances. Now, Turgot is sometimes described as a physiocrat. Um, he was actually critical as a state's stronghold on the production of grain in France. And that stronghold was very strong indeed. Uh, it, it led to, to very catastrophic uh, situations, economic situations. Basically, the king had the right to impose whatever he wanted, and he would put in charge his cronies, who would just implement what the king said in whatever way they found interesting for themselves at the time. So it was, the economy was a bit of a, the agriculture, agricultural economy was a bit of a disaster at the time. And Jogo thought that um, freeing the market would help. Right. While his theories were probably sound, um, they had very, very unfortunate historical consequences. Right. Because basically, Turgo tried to free the price of grain just before a particularly uh, bad harvest in the fall of 1775. And, and this, this led to uh, what is known as the Flower Wars. So basically, no one, no one, not enough grain had been produced to make bread for everyone. The price of bread was rising to, to such heights that nobody could eat any. Um, and, and people started to riot throughout France. And Turgo lost his job. Right. Now, Turgo's friend and colleague, the young Nicolas de Condorcet, at the time he was young anyway, tried to defend Turgo by arguing that freeing the price of wheat was still a good idea on what he felt were republican grounds. So that was before the revolution. He was already pushing a republican agenda. Um, and because it removed the arbitrary control that made producers unable to bounce back from a bad harvest. So Condorcet also tied the stifling governmental laws and the corruption of the officials implementing it growing, to growing inequalities in the distribution of wealth. And his Commerce des Blés was published in 1776, the same year as Wealth of Nations. Right, so this is a picture representing the Flower Wars. And, and this is, I think, probably a very flattering portrait of Condorcet. I like it, but he was probably not that good looking. Uh, so now Condorcet later reflected that Turgot's Reflections sur la Formation des Richesses, so Turgot's book, written in 1766, had planted the seeds for Smith's Wealth of Nations, published in 76. Now, another less generous commentator, whose name was Dupont de Nemours, wrote that everything that was true in Wealth of Nations was also in Turgot's Reflections, and that anything Smith added to Turgot's work was actually wrong. Right? <laughs> So Condorcet just think, yeah, they talked about it and this planted the seed for um, Smith's great work. Condorcet started working with Turgot as Inspector General of the Paris Mint in 1774, 10 years after Smith's visit. So he did not meet Smith, 
but the two may have corresponded later and I think I've just found evidence here that they did, so yay. Uh, and, and Condorcet sent Smith a copy of his Life of Turgo. Now Condorcet's wife who translated, um, who translated Smith, Sophie de Bruchy, married Condorcet in 1786. And she was 22 years old then. She was 20 years younger than Condorcet. And she was actually born the same year that Smith to, came to Paris. So unless Smith snuck back to Paris at some later time, and, and that, I believe, is undocumented, there's almost no chance that she met him. Right? They didn't meet. Um, but it was she who translated his theory of moral sentiments in, and considerations on the origin of languages which was appended to the third edition of TMS. And her translation, which was much more accurate than any previous one, remained the only translation of that text in French until 1999. So it was published in 1798, so it remained for 201 years. And she appended to her translation a short text of her own called The Letters on Sympathy, in which she engaged with Smith's fury, questioning some of his initial assumptions and asking how the theory might be applied to pressing social, political, and economic matters in the wake of the French Revolution. So that was quite an exciting text. All right, so before I go into that, I want to tell you a little bit about the translation practices of the 18th century. Because translation just didn't mean then what it means now. It didn't mean, you know, attempting to understand a text and reproduce it in another language. Right, so between the year that Smith came to Paris, 1764, and 1798, the year Sophie de Gauchy published her translation, there were four different French translations made of his theory of moral sentiments, seven of the wealth of nations, and two of his considerations concerning the first formation of languages. There was a total of 12 different translators working on the texts, 11 men and, and one woman. So the woman, who was Sophie Grouchy, translated both the theory of moral sentiments and the considerations on languages. Um, she worked on Smith's sixth and last edition of the TMS, and she appended her own response to letters on sympathy. Now her translation, as I said, was, you know, it was clearly very good because it remained the, the standard one and the only one in France for over 200 years. Uh, previous translations, however, were very problematic for a number of reasons. Though the first translation of TMS was, was really quite bad and Smith complained about it, which prompted a, a number of other translations to be made. None of them were terribly good and Smith apparently blamed the poor sale of his book in France on the poor quality of the translations. Now the same wasn't true of the wealth of nations. Um, there was a very good translation by the Abbé Morlet, who was a friend of Turgot, a friend of Necker, and um, a friend of the physiocrats. He'd met Smith, and he apparently had sufficient knowledge um, of commerce to understand Smith's argument. And Morlet was also a seasoned translator, although his methods were not um, uncontroversial. Now, when he translated Beccaria's Crime and Punishment ten years before he translated Smith, he decided, for instance, to reorganize the order of all the chapters, because he thought it wasn't very clear. <laughs> right. So translation in the 18th century was not the methodical work that it is now. For one thing, it was not seen as necessary to know the language one was translating from particularly well. You could use translation as a means of learning the language. That went on for quite a while. I mean, um, I think Baudelaire translated Edgar Allan Poe's stories into French, and he didn't know English when he started. So, translation in French, in particular, but also in English, I think, was, was seen as a form of domestication of the text. The foreign text had to be made fit for consumption by French readers. That meant that a translator was also, also, also often a commentator, taking it upon themselves to shorten passages, add explanations when they thought the author wasn't sufficiently clear, or simply make it fit with current French debates. Well, this often meant in practice that the translator misunderstood, misread the author, 
And that was the case for a lot of the early translations of the theory of moral sentiments. The book was thought to be too long for French readers. Some of the arguments were radically misinterpreted and some examples just too English. <laughs> Not Scottish, English. Right. <laughs> so there's um, an example of a translation that carries as much the translator as the author would be, of course, more or less translation of Cesare Beccaria's Crime and Punishment. Um, this is, here this is a good one, right? Um, which reorganizes the structure of the argument entirely. Now, the translation is the one that Voltaire used to write his commentary on Beccaria, which is still published in some editions of newer translations. So Voltaire and Morley were both concerned with reclaiming Beccaria's work for their own philosophical agenda, rather than reading it from the author's point of view. So I think, for instance, if you want a completely different reading of Beccaria from the one Voltaire proposes, you can look at Jeremy Bentham. And Jeremy Bentham probably got his translation into English from his own translator, Etienne Dumont, who was a lot more careful as a translator. So it made the, the translation made a big difference to how things were received. Um, another, another example is uh, Wollstonecraft, Mary Wollstonecraft's translation of a book by Necker, The uh, Religious Opinions. And her translation was, um, so she didn't know French very well at the time she did this either. And, and her translation was so, let's say, wild that her the publisher Johnson felt that he had to add an, you know, a warning at the front of the book, which said, you know, in rendering this work into English, some liberties have been taken by the translator, which seemed necessary to preserve the spirit of the original. Right? And you still see this warning on um, the text, which was later published in the United States, I think 50 years later, maybe. There's the same text, but published in New York, the same warning. So people didn't necessarily object to that kind of uh, interpretative translation. Now, just incidentally, Morley, 10 years after he translated Beccaria, wrote him a letter where he apologized, this is uh, what he said, he apologized to him for the liberties he took and basically for messing up his book, which was perfectly well structured, he now realized. All right, so Smith's theory of moral sentiments suffered from the bad translations, which shortened it, replaced entire sections with new, more suitable ones, and generally failed to capture Smith's philosophy. And Sophie Gauchy herself, in the first, in the introduction to Letters on Sympathy, tells us that she came to Smith's text relatively late, well, she must have been in her mid-twenties, um, because she'd heard the translation was bad and she felt she had to wait until her English was good enough to be able to read it in the original. And unlike Morley, unlike Wollstonecraft and probably many others, Sophie Gauchy's translation of The Theory of Moral Sentiment is very much what we would count as a good translation. It's accurate. She makes sure to use the same type of vocabulary as Smith. She reuses the same words in the same ways. Uh, she tries to reproduce the tone and the rhythm as far as possible. And she understands the philosophical argument. Right? And where there is something she either doesn't understand or disagrees with, she keeps her misgivings out of the translation and she puts it into her commentary, into her letters on sympathy. So it's not an interpretative translation in that sense. She tries to remain as accurate as possible. Right, so let's, let's talk a little bit about her then. Uh, she was born in 1764, so the year Smith came to Paris, in the castle of Villette, near Melun, which is not very far from Paris, about an hour's drive nowadays. It would have taken longer back then. This is it. Um, she, was, um, she was part of a very rich and old aristocratic family. Uh, they were a very literary family. One of her ancestors had been a tutor to Montaigne. And her parents kept a well-known literary salon in Paris. So she was exposed to the Paris, the French literary, literary, literary um, world from a very early age. Now, as an aristocratic daughter, she did not receive a formal education. She did not have a teacher appointed to her, but she was permitted to join in to her brother's studies. 
and she learned English, she learned Latin, she learned German and some mathematics. And in fact, she turned out to be such a good student that when the tutor fell ill, she took over. Right. Her mother, who had a reputation for piety as well as being very learned, ensured that her daughter's education was not only intellectual. Sophie and her sister, Charlotte, were taken on charity rounds to visit the poor and the sick, and they were taught by their mother how to help and to comfort and how to value the well-being of others. And this experience, seeing the pain of others and helping relieve it, makes its way into the letters on sympathy, as we'll see a bit later. And Gorshi's argument that children should, be exposed, uh, ch children should be exposed to the pain of others early on is also part of the letters. And when she was about 18, I think she was sent to the Chanoines School of Neuville, so in Normandy. Um, this was an ostensibly religious establishment, but mostly a finishing school for the very rich and the very well-connected aristocrats. In order to get in, you had to provide proof of uh, a very large income. You had to pay a lot of money. Um, and you also had to provide proof of aristocratic lineage going back nine generations on the father's side and three on the mother's. And there's an example of the kind of paper that you had to, to bring with you to the school in order to be considered for admission. Uh, this isn't Sophie Grouchy, this is some, some other, other student who went there. Um, so the school was religious, there were some religious ceremonies, but there were also a lot of balls because the part of the point of the school was to help find a girl's suitable husband. Right? So, so when she was in Neuville, uh, the young Sophie painted quite hard, but she also worked practicing her languages and putting them to good use in translating works from the English and the Italian. So we know she translated Edward Young's poetry and Torquato Tasso's Jerusalem. She also read assiduously. Um, she, she gave up her childhood favorite book, which was Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, and instead she started reading Voltaire, Diderot, and Rousseau. And all this reading had an effect. She lost her faith and she became a Republican. Now coming home to Villette, Sophie told her horrified mother that she'd become an atheist. Uh, Madame de Grouchy responded by burning all the Rousseau, Voltaire and Diderot and bringing out Marcus Aurelius again. Right. Um, every night a chastised Sophie would pray that God may give her back her faith and until it became obvious that God was just not going to oblige and at which point she gave up. Hmm. Her political radicalization and, and her atheism is probably one reason why she was attracted to Condorcet when she met him. Um, she met him through her uncle, whose son she was tutoring. Condorcet was working with her uncle, Dupetit, on, um, on a legal case. They were actually trying to argue that someone had been wrongly accused and these people were about to be uh, killed on the Catherine will, which was a horrible thing. And, Vol and Condorcet, following in the footsteps of his mentor, Voltaire, wanted to put a stop to that. And um, so she was, she was there when the two men were working together. They saw each other, they got to know each other. There was an incident with a dog, a rabbit dog, where Sophie proved that she was very brave. Condorcet fell in love. And, uh, and that was it. They were married at the uh, chapel at Villette, which is there, in December 1786. And the Marquis de Lafayette, who was an old family friend of the Grouchy, was one of their witnesses. Now, the newlyweds moved to Condorcet's apartment in the Hotel des Monnaies, which is on the uh, Quai de Conti, opposite the Pont des Arts in Paris. The Pont des Arts is the one where they've put all the, the kind of locks that used to be on another bridge, and they've moved it to the Pont des Arts. Um, so you, you can still see that building. And by then, her English was getting really pretty good, and so theirs became the house of choice for foreign visitors. They entertained Thomas Jefferson, Tom Paine, the Baron de Clutz, Etienne Dumont, and others. And their devoted friend, uh, the Dr. Pierre-Jacques-Georges Cavanis, who later marries, uh, married Sophie's sister Charlotte, was also a very frequent visitor. Now, Cavanis was a trained physician. He didn't practice very much, but he was uh, Mirabeau's doctor during his final illness. He was also a physiologist 
who wrote a series of lectures and then a book on how the body and moral character are linked. And this was very influential for Sophie Gauche's theory of sympathy. He was also a social reformer and he was involved in the testing of the guillotine before it was put to use during the revolution. He's written about that, he tells people about how the testing went and it's quite gory, so <laughs> let's not go into it. But Cavanis is also more importantly here, um, the person to whom the letters on sympathy are addressed. Right, they're addressed to a dear C star star star. And while some people thought it was Condorcet, it's quite clear her, her, her daughter tells us that it was in fact Cabanis. And that makes sense because she lived with her husband at the time. She wrote the letters so I write to him. And also because she's basing a lot of what she's saying on uh, physiology, which is what she and Cabanis had in common. So Sophie didn't stop studying after she married, and shortly after she moved to Quête Conti, Condorcet, together with another member of the Académie Française called La Harpe, founded a school called the Lycée on the Rue Saint-Honoré. And famous scholars and academicians lectured there, and the cream of Paris society learned. So Sophie was an assiduous student. She took classes in mathematics, history, and botany. And she became, you know, she was there so often, and she also she was quite pretty, so she became known as the Venus of the Lyceum. Um, she also took, at some point, lessons in painting in the studio of Elisabeth Vigée-Lebrun. So that's Elisabeth pictured here. Now, we don't know when that happened exactly, but we know that she developed skills that later actually saved her life. So we'll look into that in a bit. So Vigée Lebrun wrote in her memoirs that she didn't enjoy teaching at all, and she didn't think much of any of her pupils. But we know, we know that Sophie actually painted quite well. Through, you know, she left several miniatures, including several self-portraits. So the one in the middle is, um, is one of them. I really quite like it. And... She painted, she painted people, and we don't have, we don't have any of the portraits of others that she did left. But I found this pastel miniature of Madame Roland, which was drawn at the conciergerie. So basically her last night or her last day before she was guillotined. And she was painted there. And I thought that the style looked sufficiently like some of uh, Sophie Gauchy's paintings, that it might have been her. Who knows? Right. So she was, from the beginning of the revolution, she was a strong Republican. People called her a hothead. Uh, they blamed her husband's Republicanism on her. Right? They said Condorcet would have been very moderate if it hadn't been for his crazy wife. Um, and, you know, there were caricatures drawn of her. This is one of her... A group of women, including Sophie Grouchy, I don't know which one she's supposed to be, um, and Madame de Stael is there, and you know, all, the, all the women who were involved in the revolutions are portrayed here. Now, her involvement, her real involvement in the development of republicanism in France um, was, was in writing, actually, in journalism. Now, there's a journal called Le Républicain that was published for maybe, for less than a year, for maybe six months. There were three or four issues that came out, no more. And this is an advertisement from it, for it uh, that Jacques-Pierre Brissot published in his paper, Le Patriote Français. And it's thought that Sophie Gauchy, Condorcet, Thomas Paine, and a few others were part of developing this new newspaper. And she actually wrote a few articles that were published anonymously and um, I, I was going to say I have it on good authority that she was the author but in fact I'm the one who did the research <laughs> to argue that she was the author so if you think I'm a good authority then we have it on good authority <laughs> that it was her. Um, so she, she worked on that and she was also involved in, in, in some of the more popular movements of revolution. So here you've got a picture of the Champ de Mars massacre. So basically on the 17th of July, 1791, the king and his family had tried to escape, disguised as a, a bourgeois family. They'd been caught in Varennes, they'd been brought back to Paris. 
And a bunch of people have said, okay, that's it now. We don't want him to be king anymore. We don't want a king. We're just going to demote him and, and we're going to start being a republic instead. Right. Uh, and a petition was prepared and people were going to gather on the Champ de Mars, which was then just big field, no, no Eiffel Tower, obviously. Um, and they'd put a stage there as well. And they were all going to sign the petition. So if he was there with her baby daughter, uh, as were a lot of other women with, with their babies as well. And Lafayette with the army was kind of guarding the place. And at one point something happened. There was this scuffle or whatever, and, and Lafayette lost it. And he charged his armies into the crowds. There were a lot of deads. And at that point, when Sophie came home with baby Eliza, she told Condorcet what had happened. He said, OK, I'm not putting my family at risk anymore. We're going to stop that newspaper. So they closed the, Rep the Republica. OK, so in 1793, Condorcet had to go into hiding. All the Girondins and their associates were being you know, proscrits. They were being made outlaw and they were eventually, you know, caught and, and, and killed. So he went into hiding and Sophie was forced to leave the capital because a wife of somebody who's an outlaw was not allowed to live in Paris. So she moved to Auteuil, which is basically a suburb very close to Paris. And every day she would walk into Paris dressed as a peasant. So she'd walk in, I think it would probably take a few hours, not, not that much more. Um, and she'd, she'd go, she'd go, she'd follow the crowds who were going to witness the executions on the Place de la Révolution. She'd lose herself in the crowd, so she probably saw the guillotine at work. Then she'd go to a studio that she'd rented on the Rue Saint-Honoré, where she painted for a living. And so she, she painted miniatures. She went into prisons to paint people so that their families would have uh, something to remember them by. She also, a couple of times, she was nearly arrested, uh, but she painted the police officers who came into her house and they let her go. So it actually saved her life, almost certainly. And after she'd done that, she would again lose herself in the crowds and cross the Seine and go to Rue Servandoni, what it's now called, which was then Rue des Fossoyeurs, where Condorcet was hiding. So this is a, a place to where Condorcet was hiding. This is a picture of Condorcet dying. It's very picturesque of being found dead by the policeman. So Condorcet eventually escaped the place where he was hiding. He didn't want to put anyone at risk. He walked uh, a, few, a few miles. He walked a bit more than, than he could. He wasn't in great shape. And um, then he got caught because he went into an inn and had asked for an omelette. And the innkeeper said, yeah, sure. How many eggs do you want? He said, oh, I don't know, two dozens? They said, right, aristocrat. He does know how to make an omelet. Uh, so he was put into prison, and he died during the night there, either of a heart attack because he'd walked too much, or because he ingested poison that his friend Cabanis had given him in a ring. That's, that's a nice story, but you know, it's probably not true. He probably just had a heart attack. And so if it was, she didn't know he'd been dead for several months because no one had his name. And, and then later, after the revolution, they found that the man who died in that prison, that, that little suburb prison, actually had a, a watch, a pocket watch, engraved by Emmanuel de Grouchy who was Sophie's brother. So that's how she found out what had happened to him. But for several months, she just didn't know. So when she went to visit him in the place where he was hiding, she helped him work. She brought him books. She brought him uh, writing material. And she actually talked him out of writing something that he called an apology, where he was just going on about how miserable he'd been and how everyone had treated him wrong, and into writing a, a sketch of um, human progress which was supposed to be the introduction to a big encyclopedic project. And this is the cover page that he sent her with the whole manuscript. And it's quite clear if you read the manuscript, if you read various editions, that this was actually a joint writing project, that they worked on it together. Again, I'm going to say good authority. I'm the one who did the research on that. You don't have to believe me. You can, you can go and have a look. Um, but this, this, this was it. Uh, and when once he was 
After the terror, it was recognized that it had been wronged and it was fetched as a hero of the revolution and she edited the book, this book, for publication. Right, so why did she translate the letters, uh, why did she translate the theory of moral sentiments when she translated it in 1798? Well, her daughter tells us why. This is a letter written by her daughter with um, translation underneath. She said basically at some point, so her, all her properties was confiscated and she couldn't just, you know, make money by painting portraits anymore. For some reason, she well, maybe because everyone she'd painted was dead, I don't know. Um, and she decided that she would make some money to support herself, her daughter, her sister, and, and just a bunch of dependents as well, who were still needing to be supported by producing a translation, not only of the theory of moral sentiments, but also of um, of the, the origins of languages. And she thought, well, while I'm at it, I'm going to publish that little text that I wrote earlier. Right? And that's the letters on sympathy. So you can see here, par Sophie de Grouchy, um, Veuve Condorcet, says. And she's added to it eight letters on sympathy. Right? That's, that's the second volume, so it's at the end, so as not to disrupt from the main event, which is Smith's work. Okay, so... I don't want to take too long talking about this. Right, so I said that she'd written um, the letters on sympathy before she produced the translation. How do we know that? Well, first, her daughter says so, right? Then we have letters from Sophie Grouchy to her friend Etienne Dumont, where she says, okay, I'm sending you drafts of my letters on sympathy, the first seven, I can't find the eighth one. She says, I'd really like your feedback on that. And that was, that was in the spring 1792. Now, Dumont apparently never replied because we have another letter from Sophie Grouchy saying, look, uh, I'm a bit hurt that uh, you haven't replied to me yet. Do you really think that that awful? And maybe you can come over for dinner and we can talk it over. So maybe, maybe he did that. Maybe he did come to dinner. Maybe they talked about the letters. Now, the other thing we have, the other piece of evidence we have for the existence of the letters before the translation is Condorcet, who wrote in um, a brief text he, he wrote while he was in hiding, called advice to his daughter. He advised his daughter that if she needed any kind of um, moral education, she should definitely turn to her mother's letters on sympathy. And it's very tantalizing, she says, An another text that she's written on this. We don't have that other text, right? And in her letter to Dumont, she also tells us that she'd written, um, that she'd written A novel, the beginning of a novel. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit then about what she's actually saying in the letters on sympathy, right? So in the theory of moral sentiments, Smith argues that morality needs reason to mature, but that is basically born out of the human tendency to sympathy. In other words, morality comes naturally to us, but we need to work at developing it. But Smith doesn't explain where the tendency for sympathy comes from, and that's something that Sophie Grouchy has a problem with. She says he posits it, but he doesn't explore its origins, and she really wants to do that. So what she does is that she looks at why human beings, why those who are capable of reflection, of reasoning, have this ability to feel for each other, for others' pains. She wants to explore that. The other thing that she wants to do, which Smith didn't do because he died in 1790, right, is explore um, the ways in which Smith's theory of sympathy can be used to help reform social and political institutions after the revolution in France. So these things, together with the fact that it's a very short text compared to Smith's very long book, uh, means that the letters on sympathy are very well worth reading. So the first thing, First thing that she says about the letters on sympathy then is that um, about sympathy is that sympathy develops is triggered by a physical event. 
right? That's what she goes all physiological. That's what she, she looks to Cabernet for that. She says it happens because a baby is in contact, in physical contact with a person that feeds them, that gives them pleasure and alleviates their pain, the pain caused by hunger, right? And then that repeated contact means, she says, that the baby learns to feel what the nurse feels. Right? She doesn't say the mother, she's not like... Uh, She's not like Rousseau, it doesn't have to be the mother, it can be a wet nurse. And had she known the bottle, it could have been a father as well. Right? There was no bottle back in the 18th century. Well, nothing that would keep a baby alive anyway. So, so she says that basically you, you learn to recognize when somebody that's close to you is in pain and you build sympathy from that. Right? But it needs help and that's why she says that um, her mother here, who took her on charity rounds when she was little, did a great deal to help her learn, develop her sympathy. She says, this is what mothers and fathers and teachers need to do, right? They need, they need to see what, what difference it makes to relieve physical pain in others close up. Right? They don't need to read or theorize about it, they need to see it close up. They need to see the pain and they need to see the pain go away. They need to see the gratitude. They need to see all that. This is what early education has to be like. No. So in the next two letters, she's basically agreeing with Smith about a lot of things. Uh, I'm not going to go into this, but in the letters, that the last three letters, uh, six, seven, and eight, that's where she does the work of trying to apply sympathy to social reform in a way that's particularly relevant to France during and after the revolution. So her central argument in the letter is that uh, virtue, whether moral or political, is born out of sympathy, the ability and propensity to feel others' pain and to want to relieve it. So there she agrees with Smith. But in order for this to be possible, we need to see the suffering of others as a human being, as someone just capable, someone who's just as capable of experiencing pain as we are. Extreme inequality means that this does not happen. The very rich and the very poor do not regard each other as being part of the same species, so that they cannot sympathize with each other and will not apply the laws of morality and justice in their dealings with each other. And she says that this actually leads to crime because a poor employee is less likely to care about what happens to his rich employer. Right? I said, yeah, well, you know, he's not going to miss that. And I don't know what kind of person he is anyway. I don't care what his reaction to missing that money is going to be. He's just some rich guy. Right? Um, so this is, this is what she says. Right? says, let us remove extreme inequality so that people can actually hear the voice of humanity in each other's heart so that they can look at each other, they can recognize each other as belonging to the same species. Now I'm going a bit fast here maybe because I think, yeah, I need to, right, that's okay. All right, so she offers, I she offers a concrete proposal to reduce extreme inequality. She calculates that given the size of metropolitan France, even assuming some inequality in repartition, that would still be enough for everyone to live comfortably, either off the land or um, by selling their land and going in some other business. All it takes, she says, after an initial repartition, is a good set of laws and the absence of corruption, both of which tend to amplify economic inequalities. Without extreme poverty or extreme wealth, she also argues citizens will be in position to view each other as political and moral equals and treat each other with respect. So here's her proposal. So she's actually calculating the size of front and the size of land that can actually grow wheat. Um, and the number of families you have in France, and she says, let's start with like a fairly no, unequal distribution even. It doesn't matter as long as each family has minimum 50 livres. I haven't translated livres because uh, it wouldn't have been the same as pounds even at the time. But that, that's something that she says, you know, is, it, is enough, right? If you have that much money, you're not reduced to pressing need. Uh, you're, you get a reputation for being well off. 
So it's, it's a, you know, the worst off will have that much. But that can only work, she says, it's only possible if we suppose that laws should no longer support wealth inequality. Right? That's, that's what's needed. It's not just dividing up the land, even unequally, it's making sure that the laws follow suit. So part of what Grouchy does with Smith then is to try and derive application for post-feudal, post-revolutionary France. She remains, um, I guess, a realist rather than an idealist in that she does not attempt to eradicate economic inequality, only extreme or excessive inequality. In modern parlance, I think we could call her a limitarian. There's a great book on that coming out by Ingrid Robbins. Um, but even, even this is a radical move. Because it means, she says, changing the tax system, which benefits the rich at the expense of the poor, and replacing officials who are appointed to protect their own and their friends' wealth by elected ones who will actually follow the law. Well, so it's, it's actually quite radical. Now, very quickly, um, she dies in the end. So she lived through the terror. She lived through the rule of the directory the First Empire, the first years of the Bourbon Restoration. She remained at the heart of politics throughout with her salons in Paris and in Auteuil. And uh, we know that Napoleon Bonaparte and his brothers came to her salons. And there's one, one interesting little exchange when Napoleon told her that uh, he did not like women who meddled in politics, right? We knew that. Uh, and she replied, yeah, fair enough. But in a country where politics can actually send women to the scaffold, they'd better understand a little bit about it, right? Uh, she died at the age of 58. She left behind her daughter and grandchildren, her sister and niece, and her lover, Claude Fauriel. She left some papers, and she left Condorcet's papers to her daughter, and they were published, they were re-edited, um, and she left her own papers to her sister. Unfortunately, her sister was busy trying to get her husband's papers published, and we don't have any of uh, Sophie Gauche's papers. They're lost. So she may have written, she probably wrote a lot more, but we don't have any of it. Okay. This is where she's buried at the Père Lachaise, incidentally. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that was a fabulous uh, lecture, um, partly because uh, for those of you that may not know, um, Adam Smith wrote an extended third to the theory of moral sentiments while he was living in this house. And what that shows is that Adam Smith still struggled through what he wanted to achieve with the theory of moral sentiments. And so the, the I won't say flaws, but the limits of what he could do with the theory of moral sentiments, Sophie de Grouchy had, had, had something to say. And I think that just is really uh, so that just sort of struck me is that we know that Smith's, you know, really worked hard on those and, and added to those because he was really trying to get what is what is Smith sympathy? How is it developed? And she's added something quite, quite special to that. Um, and then like Smith, as you um, completed, was Smith was also a, very much a realist, mm. right? Not an idealist thereafter. But it's really interesting in, in that time period, we, have to, we forget that when Smith was writing, it was pre-capitalist, pre-industrial, and pre-democratic. And so Sophie de Clouchy coming in, this is right when republicanism and the, the, the wellspring of democracy was really, the, the democracy that we often take for granted today was being fomented and, and ideas of universal education which Smith, again, was very much uh, um, mm. crucial to, as was Sophie de Clouchy and these, these these elements that we take for granted today of, of, of what we owe each other and, and how do we care for the poor and the importance of having um, equal societies or some equality in society to have a truly open and, and uh, prosperous society. Um, I won't say any more because I know you in the audience perhaps have questions for our, our great speaker Sandrine. There will be a microphone going around, um, so please do wait for the microphone if you have a question. Michael in the front. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about uh, 
uh, subjects which didn't really come up in your uh, in your uh, talk, and this is sex. Now, the the uh, the, the French salon um, were notorious as also hotbeds of sex, and uh, D David Hume, you know, probably did not have sex before he left Scotland, but from what we know of his activities uh, in Paris, he almost certainly did uh, get picked up by aristocratic ladies who sh showed him the facts of life. Um, Smith, on the other hand, uh, in the theory of moral sentiment, shows really no interest in sex at all. He, do he doesn't talk about it. He doesn't mention it. And I think, I don't know, can't speak for the 18th century, but uh, certainly in the 21st century, we regard sex for all its complications as being an essential part of human morality. You can't really talk about, about the moral laws of our society without bringing sex into it. Um, so I wonder if you think that uh, Adam Smith failed us in uh, omitting any mention of this matter, whereas uh, Hume, for all, for all his uh, faults, uh, actually you know, did have a go at it, let's say. <laughs> Um, first, I'd like to, uh, to, to say that the, the, the thing about Paris, Parisian salons being hotbeds for being picked up by aristocratic women is perhaps an exaggeration. Now, when I was growing up, we had this story that, you know, boys came to England and Scotland to get laid from school, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I think definitely, this certainly not in Sophie Gauchy's salon. Also not in Manon Roland's salon or Olympe de Gouges. I mean, I think people were a lot more serious than um, we give them credit for. Now, Hume is not the only one who wrote about sex. Sophie de Gauchy does as well in the letters on sympathy. And I think when she talks about personal sympathy, so she's got um, a, a whole letter which is about different kinds of personal sympathies. Some are friendships, some are romantic love, and the one about romantic love is clearly also about sex, right? And it's, it's, it's very interesting because I think part of the things she writes there um, are written from the perspective of the female gaze. You know, she talks about attraction, about physical attraction from her own perspective. So that, that's really interesting. But she's also, she's also read Beccaria whom we were talking about earlier. And Beccaria has got some uh, very strong views on, on, on sex as, as it was practiced in the 18th century, um, in, especially in aristocratic countries, mainly, you know, a man finds a woman, wants to have sex with her, rapes her, abandons her. She has a baby, she just kills herself, or she's, you know, kicked out. And then Sophie gauchy has got... Um, a letter on the origins of injustice, right? And, and one, one of the origins of injustice that she gives us is love. But she says it's not love, right? So what, what you know, we now call crimes of passion, right? She said that's not love. It, it, it's just a power play. It's just innovated young aristocratic men who've got nothing to do with their time, who bet with each other that they're going to have this or that woman and, and basically rape around. Uh, and, and, and she says, you know, this is not how sympathy works. And, and I think reforming laws, reforming institutions would put a stop to that. Right, so she's, got, she's also got um, strong line of influence from Montesquieu, from the Roman laws, right? And, and so she, she's, got, she's got views as well about, you know, shorter marriage contracts, uh, about giving rights to illegitimate children, so things like that. So I think she discusses sex quite a lot. It's not always clear that she's discussing sex, but if you, if you look at what she's saying, it is, it's, you know, that's what's going on. And I don't, I don't know Adam Smith's text well enough, but there might be some, some also underlying discussions that aren't very clear. I don't know. So, so the, the implication is that her, her operationalization, I shouldn't use that word, but her, her 
thinking of sim sympathy comes through experience that to really have that sense of it of how it works yes and the possible suggestion is that adam smith didn't have enough experiences <laughs> in life to 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 adequately understand sympathy um in the way that she thought uh, he should i don't know that she would have i think she would have thought that somebody who's got the experience of caring for a mother for instance uh, caring for him in the right way or caring for a younger sister or a niece, as in this case, I think, would probably not be thinking of rape as, as an option, right? I think. No, certainly not. Any, any other questions? We have time for about one more question. This one there in the front. Um, uh, Professor, Tony Briggs, you know, translator of Pushkin and so on, used to sort of argue that um, really great translators, in the case of the Omar Kayam, I think it was, had really enhanced the publication enormously. In fact, the first version of that w w belly flopped, and then the translator did such a good summarizing job that it then took off and became incredibly impactful. So, so one question is, you know, is there any kind of sense in which she added uh, great value by the way she translated? Um, the other slight question is, you know, uh, was there a bit of an industry at all? I mean, uh, when I was in Moscow, they were saying, well, of course, we did plagiarize Adam Smith and we had our own version in Russian, but unfortunately, no one noticed. So, uh, you know, we, we've done. <laughs> but, but so, I mean, sometimes you get plagiarization, putting the names on, sort of student and certain pseudonyms and so on. So two questions there. But, uh. Okay, so the second one, was there plagiarization in, in France? Yeah, it, with the, I don't think so, because Smith was... Um, Smith was famous enough in France that people wanted to be known as having translated his work. Right? There was a series of translators who just put, put themselves forward and said, okay, you know, I'm going to do Smith and I'm going to do it better. Because you know, he complained about the first translation, so people really wanted to do it better. Right, and they wanted to show off to be to be known as having translated Smith better, and then I think that that precludes um, plagiarism. And your first question: Did she bring something new to the translate? You know, did she enhance the translation? I don't think so. I think um, I think she brought it maybe into debate more by writing her letters on sympathy. Right, she engaged in debate together with the translation, and I think I think that may have made a difference. Uh, certainly, her review, so her book, her translation, and her letters on sympathy were reviewed very favorably during so during the period of the directory. So Pierre Louis Redrer, for instance, thought it was a great translation, and and even thought that uh, her letters on sympathy actually improved on Smith's work. But I'm not sure that uh, Redrer actually understood. Eva Smith or Grouchy, but I think, I think people thought that she'd added value to it with her letters, but not through a translation. I mean, it's not like, so, um, uh, Madame du Châtelet, for instance, she translated Newton and she added value to Newton by making it actually clear, right? I don't think anyone would have read his work in France or in England if she hadn't translated them. Because she and, she and she actually linked his theories with Leibniz as well. So she, she did, she, she, she actually enhanced her work, but I don't think Sophie Gouchy did that. Just made it possible to debate it fruitfully. Great. Well, let's please give another round of, our, uh, of applause to uh, Sandrine Berges.